As the anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine approaches, cities and towns on the front line face more heavy shelling by Russian forces. But residents of the southern city of Kherson and other communities on the front lines remain defiant. Russian shells killed six civilians and wounded dozens this week in Kherson. The city was liberated by Ukrainian forces back in November, but Kyiv and its allies are expecting a wider Russian spring offensive. And Russian President Vladimir Putin has restated his goal of taking full control of eastern and southern Ukraine. And we can cross straight to Kherson now, where DW correspondent Nick Connolly is standing by for us. Nick, can you give us an idea of what life is like for people in Kherson and in the other liberated areas? Well, it's certainly very, very quiet here in Kherson. No comparison to when we were last here in the autumn, in November, when Ukrainian troops came back and there were people just filling the square behind me, huge enthusiasm and a sense that life could somehow get back to normal. That has definitely not happened. There are Russian troops on the other bank of the Dnipro River, just a handful of kilometers from where we're standing now. Anywhere in the city is within range of Russian artillery, really basic, cheap equipment of which the Russians have big, big supplies. So there's no need for complicated cruise missiles. This is a city that sees daily attacks. And you see even people walking very close to the walls, keeping undercover, basically expecting things to happen at any point. On the other hand, when you go into the supermarket, you can find three different kinds of almond milk. You can find foreign mineral water. All the logistics are working. The mobile phone networks back up. The power is working more or less. But there's definitely a sense that lots of people have left and they're just not believing that for now this is a safe place to be. This is a place where people are still leaving and where, you know, for the most part, civilians are keeping a very, very low profile. Nick, I know that you've been covering the hostilities in Ukraine since the start. You've talked to, to many people who've been impacted by this war. Can you describe to us how people are managing to cope with uh, living in a war zone for so long? I think there's definitely a sense that initially people were carried by their adrenaline, that somehow they could just go day by day and not think too much about what cost this was really having for them, how, what toll it was taking on their health. People were just surviving and were just doing their best to keep their houses, their families safe. Uh, and there is you know, a sense that lots of people are still in that mode, still able to do that. But there certainly are some people for whom it is just becoming too hard and that are choosing even now, months and almost a year into this war, to leave the country. There are people leaving Kherson, there are people leaving other regions for countries outside, you know, for European countries, for North America, but also within the country are heading from the east to the western regions that have been a bit safer. We spoke to three women who who had left their homes, two of whom had gone internationally, one had moved to the west of the country, and we spoke to them about how this year has been for them. Early morning, uh, we woke up uh, because we heard explosions. And I remember turning my head to my husband, and he looked at me and said, no, it can't be happening. Uh, in Kharkiv, uh, you first hear the explosion and then you hear the sirens. And in the first uh, few days of war, we heard no sirens, just explosions. But we didn't really know what to do because this is something so unusual to you. If no one attacks your country, if the war starts in your country. Uh, and we were lost. Everybody was running around with the suitcases, cars, kids crying. Four-month-old baby had breathing problems, so she needed inhalations and she needed the injections. And I took my kids to the hospital for this injection. There was air raid siren. The doctor said, go to the basement now. We went to the basement, and there we stayed for the day, for the night, and then we spent there all the night the next um, almost four months. Every time uh, when we were uh, heading, when we were just uh, ready to head to the railway station, uh, the explosion started again. Journey that takes an hour in uh, ordinary mm. circumstances took us two days. One woman started giving birth. Uh, another uh, woman lost her kid because the kid was pressed so hard it died. One woman started having heart attack. It it was. Uh, it was completely awful. It's still shaking. And by the time we went to Poland, my hands were shaking, my head were shaking. I could not say a word. By autumn, I saw that my children, their mental health is getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, in September, my eight years old uh, daughter, she was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Uh, she is on autism spectrum. And she's starting 
pulling hair off your head, pulling your eyelashes, and stop talking and stop eating. She was really bad. Uh, I cried a lot <laughs> when we crossed the border because it was a big, big relief. And maybe only after we crossed the border and went to safe Poland, uh, I realized how much stressed and scared I was all of this time, all of these eight months in, in Kiev, in Ukraine. Uh, my children were still scared of loud noises when we were at the railway station and there were these trains coming. They said, oh no, the war has started in Poland. I still struggling getting into my head that in the 21st century, people who are able to uh, send uh, spaceships out on this can uh, just stand up and go and kill somebody because of some crazy notion or idea. My Instagram feed looks like a cemetery and like a list of people who died. Uh, just when I open my Instagram, it's like one story is someone died in Bakhmut, another story is someone died in Luhansk region or something. And it's always just so young and beautiful people. And sometimes I just feel like I'm a walking target and uh, that one day uh, they could hit my house too, or they could kill my relatives, my friends. I think I got used to everything, but um, I realized that I feel stressed out like by default. Scary thing when these sirens and uh, you have to go to the shelter and people are thinking, oh, okay, I have at least like 20 minutes, I can go. <laughs> buy bread and then I'll go to the shelter or something like this. So the war is part of their lives. The war gave us a lesson, never say never. And nothing is impossible. And uh, honestly, I do not have plans because it is impossible to have plans. Nick, listening to those three women, it's very clear how people's lives were turned upside down in a matter of days, sometimes just in a matter um, of minutes, um, and how their lives are just unrecognisable um, now. And yet they still seem extraordinarily strong. Do you have... Do you see any signs at all that um, the Ukrainian resolve is is wavering? I mean, especially after Russia started targeting civilian uh, infrastructure with, you know, these massive airstrikes in the last few months. Well, we've seen some pretty extraordinary resilience and the ability of the Ukrainian infrastructure kind of people in charge to keep things going. Normally, it's a matter of a couple of days before power is restored, at least to private households. So there's always a sense that somehow there's a solution, even if it's a temporary one or a kind of unorthodox one. But somehow there's always a way around the problems that are resulting for ordinary people, at least behind the front lines in this war. As for the kind of psychological toll, people are openly talking about the fact that this is causing them anxiety that it is affecting their mental health. Lots of people say they are going to just shelve that until they're basically in safety to deal with that and to deal with these issues. If you look at the sociology, at the uh, kind of questioning of people through kind of professionals, the, the numbers are kind of pretty extraordinary. It's over 85% saying they don't want any compromise with Russia. They want to see their country deoccupied in full, and that includes Crimea and other parts of Ukraine that Russia has controlled since 2014. So certainly in the open, there's no sense that people are willing to kind of countenance any negotiations on Russia's terms, anything that would allow Russia to dictate terms to Ukraine. The one thing you hear time and time again here, though, is give us weapons, give us more equipment. This will not lead to an escalation. This will allow us to do the job quicker and bring this war to an end with fewer casualties. So that's the, the message you hear here time and time again. Obviously, it's difficult to see how a country with a population of you know, 40 million can compete in the long run with a big uh, neighbour like Russia, but certainly that's the, the desire for when you speak to people here. Nick, thanks so much for that. That's Nick Connolly reporting from Kherson. And we're going to go to Kyiv now and bring in Ina Sovson. She's a member of the Ukrainian parliament and also from 2014 to 2016, she was the deputy minister for education. Welcome to DW. Thank you for your time. Um, the UN General Assembly is voting today on a resolution to establish principles for peace in Ukraine, so calling for lasting peace. Does this make you hopeful at all? 
Well, I think on the symbolic level, that is important. It is important for the world to recognize what the road to peace is and what peace means. Peace is not given up to, to Putin's desires. Peace is not settling up on which part of our territory we give up. Peace is about deoccupying, liberating all of our territory and establishing a long-lasting peace, both for Ukraine, but also for the rest of Europe. So in that sense, it is important that we have all global common understanding of what peace means. So that uh, but despite some countries are trying to promote the idea of maybe give up part of your territory just to, to, to work peace out, that is not the, the decision that, that the global community should be supporting. But on the other hand, uh, apart from this symbolic uh, value and building the common understanding, in terms of whether that will actually lead to peace, whether Putin will actually uh, work according to, to the plan, no, I don't believe that. Putin has, has neglected all international laws possible, all international resolutions possible. So, so let's not fool ourselves that, that he will actually behave somehow differently compared to how he has been behaving uh, over the last, uh, well, basically all his president's career. I understand very clear. I'd like to draw on your background in education, if I may. Now, schools in Ukraine have been holding classes remotely in anticipation of further Russian strikes on tomorrow's anniversary. But can you give us an idea of what this whole year of war has done to the Ukrainian education system? Well, uh, first, we have to remember that this is not the first challenge in school year for our children. My son is 10 years old. He goes to the fourth grade. So the COVID started when he was in grade one. He is now in grade four. And his whole school career, there was some interruption in his schooling. They would switch to online mode or they would simply not be studying for a short period of time when the, the big war erupted uh, last um, uh, February. Uh, this has had immense effect on, on, on the schooling of, of our children. And, and my son is actually the lucky one because he's in Kiev and his school in Kiev does have the bomb shelter. So the interruption he's having is basically he has to go to the bomb shelter every time there is an air raid alert, which does happen pretty often over here. But that is nothing compared to the interruptions that kids uh, near the front line are facing, or particularly kids who are on the occupied territory Though there are not many of them left there, but still, they basically are either forced to study according to Russian curriculum, where they've been forced to learn Russian language, to learn Russian anthem, to, to wave Russian flag and to praise Putin, who basically destroyed uh, their lives. Um, so so, so it, it, it's terrifying. And I'm extremely concerned about the, the educational gaps, educational losses for our children, because that will undermine their future in long years to come, even after we win this war. The gaps in education are going to have so much long-lasting effects that, uh, that, that I can't even imagine. Yeah. So this is in, indeed very difficult. Most schools uh, don't have the good enough bomb shelters. So, yeah, the situation is, is will have very long-lasting effect for us yeah. as a country. Yeah. You have campaign, uh, campaigned for um, greater gender equality in the past. Can I ask, has the war pushed this issue onto the sidelines or has it in fact increased the need to focus on these kind of values more than ever? I think the war had double effect in that sense, because on the one hand, of course, the majority of those fighting in the war directly are men. But also, remember that 50,000 women are fighting in the front line in the Ukrainian army. So we are actually much more diverse in terms of our army. And I think that this has actually given a boost to the idea of gender equality here in Ukraine. So despite war typically leading to more masculinity in the political discourse, but in our situation, actually, uh, the, the, the society is recognizing that there is a significant number of women fighting. And even uh, we are recognizing that there are LGBT people fighting in the army. And that gives them more visibility. And that is the ground for calling for, for equal rights for those groups of people. Uh, but of course, we cannot also shy away from the fact that, uh, of course, th there is also stereotypization to an extent, because many women had to leave the country with their children. So being sort of streamlined in a stereotypical, um, you know, uh, women's role. So, so this, this is a bit of a, of a counteracting uh, tendency overall. But I think that uh, because uh, because of the war, we are becoming more and more aware of what we are fighting for.
And gender equality is, is one of those issues. We don't want to be like Russia, where home violence is basically legitimate. We don't want to be like Russia, where homophobia is part of the, of the national ideology. So, so this is also actually pushing us uh, forward in terms of gender equality. The, the, the process is not perfect, I, I admit to that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Sobson, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, President Zelensky has garnered international praise for his wartime uh, leadership. What's your assessment? Do you think that he should have done something differently? Well, I think that, uh, and I'm here speaking as a member of parliament from the opposition political party, uh, but I recognise that he actually has done a good job um, as the president uh, in his address to the, to the, to the world. I think that is the part of the job that he did perfectly. And he also divulged all the uh, military decision making to the military professionals. So, so that is why, uh, why we are winning on, on, on the front line, because the professionals are actually making those calls, not politicians. And that's very, very important. Would he have done something different uh, during the wartime? Probably no. I think he could have paid a bit more attention to the army as we were preparing for this big war. Uh, but it's too late to talk about that. We should be focusing on the current moment. And I think mm -hmm. at the time being, he's doing a good job advocating for the whole country. I'd just like to ask you one uh, short last question. When you were talking about the education, you were saying when we win the war, it will take an awful lot of work um, to, to uh, help our children. Do you believe Ukraine will be able to one day restore its borders to what they were before Russia's invasion? I don't have any doubts about that. And nobody here has any doubts, simply because we don't have a choice. This is existential for us. We either win uh, or we just lose and we stop being who we are. And we don't want to do that. But also, we have proven that we can be winning. We have been winning the last half year against the second biggest army in the world. And I think that, that we have proven, our army has proven, that we are actually a very strong army. Uh, and, and that is why giving weapons to Ukrainian army is actually a safe bet. That is not leading to escalation. That is actually leading to de-escalation. Our army, uh, a year ago, uh, many Western powers mm -hmm. were saying, we cannot give these weapons to Ukrainian army because they don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. We have proven that our army can do miracles. So I have no doubts that we will win. We just need to decrease the number of casualties on the way to this victory. Inna Sobson, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, many thanks for joining us on DW today. Thank you.